fits and starts. We learned that it was going to be a movie. It was pretty crazy, the hype that uh, came almost immediately from the first airing of Power Rangers. We were filming the, uh, the you know, TV show and stuff, and, and we heard that we're going to be doing a big movie. The rumor mill started almost as soon as the, the, the show was a hit. We did this big public appearance at Universal, and it closed down the 101 freeway, and it closed down the park, and I think... Because of that, it generated so much buzz that obviously a uh, higher studio wanted to come in, and I think that's when the talks really started coming into fruition for the movie. We were told by Saban everything's going to be great, but then we knew Fox was involved, which is a big movie, like millions and millions of dollars in this movie. Saban had to worry about the image of it. They wanted the show to continue. So there was this tug of war about the demographic. Is it going to be like Batman, dark, higher demographic, much more violent? Or is it going to continue to be sort of like Mighty Mouse meets Superman, innocent and fun? Fox told me they were worried that the script wasn't getting to where they wanted to. So they hired me to come in and get the script in order. And they already had a start date. So I was a little bit nervous about having a start date, but no script. So uh, Arnie Olson and I got together and we, we hammered out a good script. You know, my, my, my concept was to take the audience on a journey like the Wizard of Oz. So we're going to a, a foreign place where we run across obstacle after obstacle trying to get to our goal. And that's what we set out to do. And I, I think um, Arnie did a great job with the script. 6,000 years ago, a morphological being known as Ivan Ooze ruled the world with a reign of unparalleled terror. He was on the verge of completing construction of his ultimate weapons. What happened to him? A group of young warriors like yourselves lured him into a hyperlock chamber and buried him deep underground. Ryan Spicer was an amazing person to work with. He was kind of new to it, too. I, I know he'd been directing a lot of things, but I, he told us in the beginning, this is my first movie. So we were like, it's ours, too. <laughs> I feel like we all got along right from the, right from the start, um, unless they say it differently. <laughs> Did somebody say it differently? I think he had a, a really good vision of the show and took the time to, I think, speak with every actor and really find out what we were about and find out what our character was about and really incorporated us a lot in in the movie and our opinion. So I appreciated that about him. And I remember there's this scene where we lost all our powers and we have to search our inner, find our inner animal spirit. In the script, the way it was read was like, she goes through everyone and then the frog, originally it was just about speed and agility. In fact, we shot some stuff, some training sequence stuff that didn't make it into the movie. But then uh, I wanted to try something else. I asked Brian, I was like, hey, can we try something where I'm like, maybe I'm bummed out about it? And he was like, well, let's do the way the script is, you know, and then we'll, if we have time, we'll try it out. And so we did it like the script was written. And he's like, all right, well, what were you thinking? You know, I was like, well, if I'm bummed out. And then she comes over and they start, we started working it out. And she says, Adam, what's wrong? I'm like, I'm a frog. It's like, and then they added her line, you know, yes, a frog like the one you kissed to get a handsome prince. And uh, it worked, you know, and then they just, all right, let's do that. And so we worked that out and we shot that. And that was like, the one little thing that I felt like, yes, all right, I got something in the film now. Um, but if if Brian was like, nah, then it wouldn't have happened. But he was like, yeah, okay, you're sure. Let's let's see you do something. Adam, what's wrong? I'm a frog. <laughs> yes, a frog. Like the one you kiss to get a handsome prince. He gave me the freedom to experiment with um, Ivan as much as I wanted. There was never a moment when he said, oh, I don't think that's the right way or something like that. He was always enjoying what I did, which encouraged me to go even further. I think circumstances force us to choose a new leader. And I pick me. <laughs> he was a nice guy. He was kind of the, the, looked at as the sort of whiz kid of motion pictures at the time. He was really trying to innovate what to do with special effects and stuff like that. Very visual director. I felt like he knew what he wanted. You knew he had a vision, because every time he would come on set, I mean, he definitely had something to prove. It was almost like his breakout movie. It was like he finally had gotten this moment. He'd gotten a really big movie. The anticipation of the Power Ranger movie was huge. So it was kind of cool, because we were the same way. You know, we, we wanted to be more than just this television show and just this thing that people watched after school we wanted to take it to the next level let's do it guys right it's morphin time Wait later. i was uh kind of excited about bringing the television show to life on a, on a feature format 
making things much bigger and more impressive on the big screen. Much bigger budget. The scale of everything was a lot bigger. Um, and you could definitely feel that. For us, we're actors. I don't care what kind of camera we're working with, big camera, 35, 16 millimeter, uh, video camera, doesn't matter, we just do our job. So we figured, you know, we're just gonna go out there and do the same thing. Well, it wasn't the same. The only difference was everything was bigger. Everything was on the next level. The costumes were on the next level, the command center, everything. So it was really cool seeing Brian do his thing and then he kind of knew where we were coming from too. We all kind of had something to prove. So we just would show up every day and try to work as hard as possible. It's time. Directing this movie for me was uh, was a dream, actually, to be able to do a, a film. I had been doing a lot of television before that, doing some pilots, so this was a nice step up to really bring uh, bring my my visual style to life. You know, I like moving the camera, I like telling the story with the camera, I like creating you know moods in the scene with the camera. This place gives me the creeps. I heard that. <laughs> Got a bad feeling about this place. He was a very nice guy, very soft-spoken, unassuming guy. You'd never think he was a big director. I think it was the first day or the second day of shooting. We, um, this, was, this was my big first movie. So we, we closed the streets down uh, in Sydney and we had cars askew and we were doing the, the monsters that were crushing, crashing through the city and smashing cars and terrorizing the town. And we had the whole, like, one section of the city shut down for this. And the news reporters were out there from the papers and it was a, a pretty big deal. And I'm doing my thing and my AD, my first AD, Steve Love, who I love dearly, had a, had a, um, uh, a bullhorn and he was communicating with all the extras in the background and everything. And um, the next day in the paper, uh, Steve Love was the director of the film. The, 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 uh, the newspaper reporters got it wrong because he was the one yelling in the megaphone. They thought he was the director and he got all the credit on my first movie. On, on the, so that was pretty funny. The series was a lot faster as far as like how we would shoot because we didn't have a lot of time and we would shoot um, in a week. There's like three or four episodes and you just jam right through them. And so going in and, and doing the movie, things definitely took longer. You'd be on one scene and you'd shoot one segment of a scene all day long. And we were like, we're gonna be here a little longer than three months. <laughs> we knew right away that it was gonna go over. That was odd for us because we were used to doing one, two takes and that's it. This guy had us doing like 30 takes of everything from every angle. But then when he got that take, he he got what he wanted, you know, so. Um, which was really cool. It was fun. You know, we had a great time together. It was a big, you know, it was a, it was a big undertaking to make this movie. Oh! We're out of here. Right. When I started the movie, we were told we had to shoot the movie out of the United States. We had to find some place outside the United States to shoot the film. So that was fine. Uh, we searched around and we found Australia, which was a fantastic location for all, the, all our settings. And we started looking for some local crew. And uh, I found that the local crew there was fantastic. They had worked on a lot of projects that I hadn't heard of, but I looked at the resumes and looked at some of their work and um, happily got them involved. And uh, it turned out, uh, to our advantage, I think, you know, being able to shoot out of the country and s have people from a different point of view and from a different place helping, uh, helping create the look of this movie. Wow. Amazing. What is this place? These are the ancient ruins of the Ninjeti Temple. Paul Murphy, it was great. We found him in Australia. We worked very well together and uh, he, Back then we used a lot of lights, a lot more lights than you use today. So I remember at some scenes I would go, hey, that's maybe too many lights. Let's turn some of those off. It looks a little bright. So I wanted it to be really a contrasty movie. So our art department was fantastic. We had Colin Gibson, who was our art director, and he was carving the monsters out of styrofoam himself. I remember going down to the set and just seeing the white styrofoam all over him, and he was just gung-ho. He, he helped us build a lot of these sets, and he just won the Academy Award for Mad Max uh, as, as a production designer a few years ago, so I'm real proud of him. 
was a real pleasure working with him. He was a great, uh, great asset to the look of the, uh, of the movie. Craig Stearns was our production designer as well. Uh, one big set we built in um, the fairgrounds there at, um, in Australia, which is now, I think, Fox Studio. But back then it was a fairground. It was a big empty warehouse that we built, the, the Ivan Ooze factory that had the big vats of purple ooze and it had the, the gears turning. And I had sketched that up on a piece of paper and, and gave it to Craig and, um, and Colin. And they came back with that set. I was like, wow, that's exactly what we, what we drew. And it was, it was a good introduction to the, the crews and the talent that Australia had to offer us. We were really lucky to have those guys. Parents of Angel Grove, you have completed my ectomorphic art. But frankly, I'm sick of your ugly faces and your dull personalities. Yeah. <laughs> They shot a lot of it in uh, downtown Sydney. There was the construction site, it was an actual construction site that had stopped construction for some reason. And so we were able to use this whole place uninterrupted. There wasn't any other workers there. And then they went up to uh, far north Queensland for a lot of the jungle stuff. There was a rock quarry down south where they filmed uh, some of the stuff of Dulcia. All over the coast of Australia, we shot at some Kayama Beach, which has those rock structures that are coming up out of the water and that was fun it looked like another planet right it was really beautiful you okay i was just thinking about zordon well to make it bigger for the big screen the first thing we went after was the the costumes obviously you know the costumes in the tv show are like spandex and they're flat and they're stretchy uh to make the movie bigger on the big screen we needed to make them look more like armor and thicker and bulkier and beefer, beefier so we brought in uh, Ted Van Dorn, who was an illustrator, and we started working on the concepts for uh, making these costumes uh, look better for the film. Everything was different. The helmets were different, the suits. In the series, it was spandex, and it was super light, and you could move around, no problem. And also the pads, you know, that, that was used to have the armor was incredibly heavy. We'd have four-hour costume fittings. Every single piece was molded to our bodies. And I'm not quite sure what the suits ended up weighing, but I think around 18, 20 pounds. But the problem was more difficult than that was the seams in the legs. You didn't have the freedom to go, ah, do all this sort of thing. It was, it was restrictive. And so they had to continually change things, especially for like any of the stunt guys, so that they could do their thing. They wanted to go with this kind of a vinyl sort of, uh, was it leather, patent leather type material. And it just didn't have any give in it. I heard the kids uh, had some problems with them. But we really tried to make them um, movable and have all the mobility they needed to do the fights and, and to be in the costumes. I'm sure they weren't comfortable, um, but we, we certainly tried to make them as comfortable as possible. I'm sure they were hot in those costumes as well, too. I feel like the helmets were, a, they felt a bit more claustrophobic. Um, but they had built in fans, but they didn't always work. They would break down. We had a few of the characters go down. It was one day that was really hot out. and. And I think he got uh, a little bit of heat stroke. He was fine, though, after that. Any film that you see, if it looks cool, it's probably very difficult to move around in. I want you guys to meet some. Uh -oh. And then one of the producers said, well, I think the Power Rangers should be scene. We, we want to see them acting, so I want to see their faces in the fight. When I watched the series, I felt like, you, you know, you weren't able to see the characters emote through their face and their, and their expressions through their eyes, which is what actors do when they're wearing those, uh, those costumes. And I said, well, it's not really the actors in the fight. It, as the Power Rangers, it's the stunt team. All of these special poses and things, the, the actors don't know that. They've never done it. And, and they said, well, I want to do it. So they shot that. They had tried to make the actors do it, and the actors were like, what are you talking about? So then we had to go back and shoot with the uh, stunt team. So I said, let me just shoot a test footage, right? We'll shoot some with, with showing the face of the Red Ranger, and then some with the mask on, some with the whole visor and everything. We'll do a few different versions like that, some with just the mouth showing. We'll do all these different versions. I wanted to sort of 
uh, have the audience be able to see our actors in those costumes. And if they were always in the visors, there was no reason to ever have the actors in the costumes because you never saw their faces. So I wanted to, to tell the audience that there were those of the real kids in those costumes when they uh, when I when I wanted to. So we were we were like this. I remember our helmets and our, you know, it was one of those things where we, you look dumb a long time ago. <laughs> we used to say that, and uh, we see them. I, I joke around. I'm doing my lines. I'm like, can you recognize me? No, I can't recognize you. Good. They had them where they'd rise up. They had them where they'd go from tented to clear. Uh, so they tried so many different things. We shot in various different ways. So I, I shot that footage, and it's pretty good, but you can tell the guys are so stiff. So we shot with the visors out, and then went back, and then put the visors back in. <laughs> Our markers are online. We got the power. All right. Hang on, sword on. We're on our way. Let's do it. We first got the parts on Power Rangers. They basically told us immediately, you're going to do the series, and in a month and a half, you're going to be leaving for Australia to do the movie. So that was like... I was like, I struck gold, you know? I was like, not only am I on a TV show, but I'm actually going to be in a movie. So while we were filming the movie, the character change and the whole power transfer thing all happened in, that was in November of 94 is when that happened. And we started filming in July of 94, and then November they started showing the new episodes. I'd be walking around in my yellow shirt, and they'd be like, Trini, Trini. <laughs> they just figured if you're in yellow, you're Trini. And I'd be like, hi. <laughs> like, I didn't care that they didn't know who I was. I was like, as long as they're calling my name or they think I'm someone, then I'll take it. <laughs> I heard you're in line to be a ranger yourself one of these days. Nah, that's impossible. Hey, anything's possible. They stepped up to the plate. Everything I wanted to do with them, they were able to do and wanted to do and gung-ho to do. Uh, I think the hardest thing, one of the hardest things for me in, in just shooting with all these guys was composing shots where they were all in the frame and they all looked good in the frame. And uh, I just watched the movie a few months ago and even I was like amazed at how good they looked in almost every scene. It's really hard to compose that many people in a shot and make it look good and different every time. So it doesn't look like the same formation where they were lined up in the same formation, you know, that heroic pose, that, that V formation that we used quite a bit. But I tried to mix it up and make it look different so that you, every scene didn't look the same. But that was a challenge. I think that was one of the bigger challenges was, was making them all look good. Paul Schreier and I had so much time off in Australia that we went native. I bought a car, drove out to the outback, and of course it's different for the Rangers than for us. When we first got there, we were shooting nights. We shot a long time in the pit. Things were slow on a movie, shooting like one page a day, few lines, and just doing nothing but sitting around and makeup. So Paulie and I got there and we're instantly off. Which meant we'd go by the set and harass all the rangers, you know, late at night, go to the bars, go by the rangers. Hey, you guys, you, uh, you working? We're not. Uh, 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 uh. The first couple days on the set, it was like, hey, hey Polly, how you doing? It's good to see you. By the end of the, the third week, they're like, <laughs> don't go to sleep tonight. Don't go to sleep. <laughs> that was a close one. Uh -huh. You hungry? <laughs> Always. <laughs> Paul was the first guy that I wanted to bring in for, for Ivan News. He was the only guy. I loved him in Indiana Jones and everything else he's done. And I had a phone call, a uh, phone conversation with him uh, when he was in London. And we had a nice chat and I sent him the script. It was completely off the wall, the first script. It was um, wonderfully imaginative. Uh, Ivan News was more of a shapeshifter in that. A bit of that remains in the film. But um, in the original script, for instance, at one point he became black, another point he became a woman. Anything you wanted to imagine he could become. So auditioning for it was just like throwing balls in the air and seeing what landed, you know. Guys and girls, girls and guys, gather round and feast your eyes. I promise you all, you just can't lose when you've got your own supply of Ivan's ooze. What are we supposed to do with it? Show it to your parents, show it to your friends. When you've got your ooze, the fun never ends. I encouraged, encouraged him to, uh, to do it, and he, he agreed. 
But we were so lucky. He's a, he's a brilliant actor. He's a genius. And you can see it. Like, as soon as he came on set, he's very friendly, total professional. We put him through hell, I think, though, because the, the makeup that we wanted him to be in for this character that we created was full prosthetic makeup. It took him three hours, maybe four hours in the morning to put it all on. The first time we did it, when we were testing it, it was seven hours. But after that, it was regularly four and a half hours every day. So when the film was, when they were filming and would start at 7.30 in the morning, I had to start at three o'clock in the morning and sit there for four and a half hours while this was put on. I realized what it, it was a mental challenge. Where do you put your mind while that is happening? And of course, what I actually did was fall asleep once I'd got into it and re relaxed in the process. And then two or three hours to take it off. I was drinking Guinness in those days and I would have a straw because the thing went inside my mouth and I had the false teeth. I couldn't pull it off. It had to be taken off very carefully. Not to be reused, it was generally not reusable. <laughs> He had teeth that were glued onto his teeth, so it was hard for him to even speak. Rather than go through the process of taking them out, they were quite painful. Uh, I ate smoked oysters for the shoot, which was just, so I could open my mouth and just drop them down. That was absolutely delightful. But it actually made the character even better. He's got a little bit of a lisp and, 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 uh, um, and the chin thing. It was just fantastic. He's nothing but a slime-infested jelly donut! <laughs> Shut her up. Whoa! Your feebleness is staggering. So we only had a limited time in a day to shoot with him before his time was up. And I think that um, as our schedule got deeper, deeper into the, sh into the movie, his skin started getting irritated from all the glues and all the stuff. All my skin flared up. Nobody had thought, and I had, certainly hadn't thought, that you can't put prosthetics on skin every single day for 12-hour days without it affecting, you know. So we had to take time off after that. I think our schedule changed a little bit just to accommodate that because he was getting really uncomfortable and his skin was getting rashed and red, and, and I really apologized to him for that. I didn't, I didn't know how to make that better for him, but, man, he really, um, he really stepped up to that part. And, and we put him, not only was he in that big, heavy costume, I think his costume was the heaviest. I couldn't sit down in the costume, so there was a sort of slanted stool that I could lean against. We had him in, in some of these big high heel boots so that we could make him bigger and taller than everybody. And that, I think I remember him twisting his ankle once. I fell down the steps and sprained my ankle, so I had to be taken to the hospital to get it checked out. I wasn't able to walk on it. But of course I had the whole mask on. So it took an hour and a half to take it off. So I couldn't do that. I was able to get out of the costume and then put a dressing gown on. They took me off in a car to the hospital. Now it was a series of small clinics in the Sydney suburb. And uh, you know you've been in a hospital and when you go in you suddenly see somebody who's got something terribly wrong with them. And you avert your eyes and think, oh, what's that? I don't want to look at that too closely. Well, that's what happened to me. They wheeled me in in a wheelchair because I couldn't walk. And there I was with this great purple mask on with bones sticking out, silver teeth, purple eyes, purple tongue. And people were looking at me going, oh, what has that man done to himself? You know, that is disgusting. And the first clinic we went on, went in the uh, x-ray machine, wasn't there, it was in another building. They had to push me up the high street to the next clinic and people were averting their eyes all along the pavement because they didn't want to look at this gross person. <laughs> Ew, gross. Too kind, allow me to introduce myself. I'm the galactically feared, globally reviled, universally despised. They call me Ivan Ooze. Yeah, it was actually really inspiring to see him just kind of do his thing. And sometimes you catch yourself going like, oh, wait, are we supposed to be doing something? I'm just watching him act. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that guy is amazing. And it's just his voice, you know, his voice just cuts through. His theater voice is just fantastic. Now I'm beginning to get really angry. <laughs> <laughs> Plainly, 
having all that makeup and a complete disguise, there was never any sense of um, this is this might be embarrassing for me. In fact, after all the makeup, you know, uh, anything could happen then. Nobody knew who on earth was behind it. <laughs> there was a lot of uh, you know shoots and reshoots, and we had uh, you know. We shot with a completely different Dulcia. We ended up starting off shooting a sequence that was very tame. It was a training sequence, and this was with our, the other, other Dulcia, Mariska Hargate, who was the original Dulcia. But we started filming the very first week and um, with a training sequence with Dulcia training the Power Rangers how to get their new powers. And there was no visual effects. It was all practical. We shot it at a... Um, a Japanese Zen garden, so it looked real pretty and it looked like it was on another planet. But honestly, it wasn't a, a scene that I wanted to shoot. They weren't scenes that I wanted to shoot because they had, there was no action, there was no, it was just a bunch of talking and learning and talking and learning. And uh, the studio saw that week of dailies and uh, we stopped production. They weren't happy with it either. And I, I told them, I said, we really need to, um, we really need a little bit more money to, to put the action back in that you guys love so much in the new script that you got. So, so we did. We stopped for a little while. We put some stuff back in the script. And ultimately, the studio recast that part with Gabriel Fitzpatrick, who I originally wanted for the part. When I went to Australia to read, they wanted somebody local. Uh, I read a bunch of uh, women out there and uh, fell in love with Gabriel. She was perfect for the part, I thought. And the studio resisted that because I think they had somebody else in mind. Uh, and they did. They had Mariska Hargate, uh, which was fine. I loved her, too. She was great. Uh, and like I said, she came out, and we filmed for a week. And I think it wasn't, wasn't Mariska's fault. She was great. I think it was just the scenes that we ultimately had to shoot because of the budget cuts. And they, they didn't like those scenes. And ultimately, they, I don't know if they blamed her or if they just decided that she wasn't right. But... Um, she went home, and when we started back up, we were able to bring Gabrielle in, who we wanted originally, and, and the rest is history. Uh, I thought Gabrielle looked like a goddess. We put her in that outfit with her red flowing hair and her beautiful eyes. She just looked like a goddess from another planet, and uh, that's what we were looking for. And her acting and everything that she brought to that part, I just thought was, was, was perfect. Very deep within each of us is an animal spirit waiting to be released. Close your eyes and look deep inside. We broke up first unit and second unit. Second unit did, you know, a lot of the fighting stuff at night. I remember I would shoot all day at the construction site and then, you know, tag team with second unit as we were going home, they were coming in at night to do a whole night's work of, uh, of stunts. Going down there, I had a, a tough time because they, they wouldn't allow the stunt team to come. Which we really needed because they knew all the moves, they knew the show. And yeah, we had a little bit of pushback from the government because they obviously want to hire, want us to hire um, uh, local people there, right? So what I had to do was do some paperwork finagling and put the stunt team down as actors who played the Power Rangers. We said, I said, um, well, the actors play like Jason Frank plays Tommy Oliver, but he doesn't play the White Ranger. The White Ranger is played by this guy. And so I, each, each guy became an actor. So I brought them down as actors, which it didn't go over too well with uh, the guys down there. But at the time, the reason, the reason I did that, not only because I wanted to pay back the, the real Power Ranger stunt team for making the show a hit, but also uh, back then there was no, nobody was doing this kind of reactions, these crazy over-the-top reactions. So... I tried. I, I tried to get a few guys, and then they were learning as they went along. But even they, they said, "Yeah, you're right, man. We, we can we can learn from them and pick this up." And so, got everybody there working together, and we did a cool cool show. Everybody did. Everybody got to do a bit. It was terribly exciting, and to to get to go do a feature, um, you know, I I didn't see that coming either, and it was so exciting. Oh. Ah!
it was completely different because it was a whole different team. We were no longer in the comfort of Valencia. There was pressure, but it wasn't the same as the pressure of the TV show. I did a, uh, a shot with the White Ranger spinning up, a wire gag, spinning up, landing on a thing. So the way I did it was I would shoot different frame rates, move him slowly, and later on, on some other movies, but friends of mine told me they tried to imitate that, but they thought you have to do it for real, super fast. So they were using ratchets and jerking people up into the ceiling, but on the behind the scenes you'll see he's just moving up slowly. So I do those things, like sometimes six frames per second, which is super fast. Up and over, let's do it! pre-production we had um, rat suits. Originally the villain was going to create these rats that would come up and be giant rats running around on two legs. And I looked at the rat suits and I thought, can't we make a way for the guys to see? Because there's no there's no vision, that their head's in the neck, they can't see, they can't move, they can't really do anything. I said, we'll try to do something with it. And I said, you know, they can't move their legs apart. They can't move at all. So I said, will you please, just just for me, just make a gusset in the crotch and make stretchy areas so that you can move. Just just, just that. And they went, sure, sure, sure. So then we got down to Australia. Suits come out. We're ready to shoot. None of that has been done, right? So I, I shot that footage, and it's pretty good, but you can tell the guys are so stiff trying to move. And I would have to stand off screen with the rat suits. And when it was time for a guy to rush in, he had no idea. He knew the stunt he had to perform. He knew he was going to get hit. So we, I would just say, you know, just hit him for real. And I would push him, push the rat suit, and the guy would go running out there, and then wham, and then he would do his, his reaction. So it was, it was ridiculous. But we did get to use the rat suits. We, uh, Shuki and I shot two episodes of the TV series while we were in Australia. We did use the rat suits on that. <laughs> The movie fell behind schedule. And so when it fell behind schedule, we had to go back to shooting the TV show. So yeah, we decided, we decided, <laughs> Polly and I decided that they were going to shoot it in Sydney. So there's like five or six episodes in Sydney. Paul Schreier was the first AD and I became the second AD. Tony Oliver came down, produced and directed. Shuki Levy came down, directed and wrote as well. So it was, uh extremely demanding on so many levels because um, you have all the movie producers wanting something done then you have all the TV producers wanting something done and then this whole thing called uh, voiceovers that needed to get done um, it was uh, extremely I think all of us were stressed and pushed to our limits uh, while we were in Australia for those six months um, just trying to appease everybody we were shooting at this place called Old Sydney Town north of Sydney. So over our Christmas break, that's what we were doing. We were shooting the TV show, you know, using Australian talent, Australian crews, um, Australian makeup artists, Australian locations, and there's old Paulie and me running the crews. So it, that was probably the most frantic, I think it was two and a half, three weeks of our lives. Group one, we'll take the north side of town. Team two will... Oh, no, 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 no. Mission to speed, sir. What would you like team two to do, sir? <laughs> Sorry, sir. Go on. <laughs> there I was, uh, 20 years old, sitting dressed like a British soldier. <laughs> well, there's a guy dressed like a rat dangling from wires on an air cannon. You're going, ready, lock it up. With the sword, action! Oh, get rid of Cut, take him to the hospital. Yeah. Good times. was made before CGI was very was big. 
It was very new, it was very expensive, it was very time consuming, and uh, it took a long time to actually make it look realistic and, and good. Nowadays, you can do it on your laptop in a couple hours. Back then, it was days and days of rendering. And anyway, so my approach was we didn't have, we didn't have the money. Our budget was, um, when I started, our budget was $20 million. When, I, when we re rewrote the script and redid our schedule, we needed $25 million. Uh, but we never got that from the studio. They said, you have 20 and that's it. So we ended up having to cut a bunch of stuff out that we really wanted to do. But uh, so our approach to the visual effects was, I said, well, let's just do, let's do everything. Let's do every kind of visual uh, approach to, to, to accomplish what we need that we can. The Black Plague! The Spanish Inquisition! So the only CGI that we used was in the ending sequence when the Zords were battling in the streets. The Zords were CGI. But the city wasn't. The city was a miniature that we built on a soundstage. The miniature being the buildings were maybe 12 feet tall. We built an entire city in there, and we storyboarded the whole thing. And it makes it more difficult this way. Like today, when you see Transformers, the whole city is CGI. The characters are CGI. You can manipulate the camera 360 any way you want to go when you're in that world and make, and make the show even better when you're, when you're in that world. We didn't have that luxury. We had to storyboard everything. We had to shoot background plates on the stage with the city with the city buildings and we had to do motion control moves which is a camera that's on a crane and a rig that's able to repeat the moves so we had to do every motion control move for the background plate of the CG that we were creating based on the storyboard so there was no room to change or manipulate things later we had to have it all done uh, before we went out and shot uh, and that was a long arduous process to do that <laughs> Shall we, Tango? All the other visual effects in the show are either real matte paintings with paint, or we really did stuff on wires. Uh, there's a dinosaur uh, sequence where they, a dinosaur attacks them, and I made that a big puppet. There's actually a giant styrofoam dinosaur that was 15, 20 feet tall. And we, had a, we, we were in a jungle. We ran a cable from one tree to the other down the middle of the set. And we hung this thing on a cable, like on a slider, so it would slide one way and we could get it to turn around and come back the other way, but we couldn't get it to go left or right. We'd only go one direction or the other. So I had to really storyboard that sequence out to make it look like the, the monster was alive and wasn't just going in two directions. So it was fun. We got to play with all the different kind of uh, ways to trick the audience in making things to believe that they're real. We did another sequence where the, the Tangu birds in a flock flew into the construction site to meet Paul Freeman. And we did that practically. You know, normally you do that with CGI or visual effects. I actually took a construction crane that was, I don't know, 300 feet high. We built a truss and we hung about 10 or 12 of those stunt guys in the Tangu outfits on cables off of this truss and we raised it up 400 feet in the air and brought it in and had them land with a, with a crane operator controlling the whole thing. I was a little scared about doing that because it was, looked dangerous, but again, there wasn't enough CGI and a research back then to, to do that and make it look realistic. So uh, it was kind of fun doing it that way. Ah, my tango! I think at the end of the day, we got, we got a little bit of, you know, of everything in the show, visual effects-wise. When we opened uh, the feature film at Grauman's Chinese Theater, it was probably one of those surreal actor moments that you uh, always dream about as a kid when you're dreaming about wanting to be an actor. At least I did. It was life-changing. I mean, I think opening a movie at Grauman's Theater is like what every actor dreams of. It's kind of where you feel like, I've made it. Or you, not that you, you don't feel like you've made it, but it's a, such a sense of accomplishment that to know that all these amazing actors have been there at one point, and here you are, you're there. Fans were lined up all over the street, and then they pull us up one by one in limousines, or two by two in limousines, and uh, we get out and they introduce us. Getting out in the limos and getting all dressed up, and you know, it was really cool. It was, it was an amazing experience, you know? I mean, that's just, I still smile about it, you know? I mean, they're never gonna be able to take that away from me no matter what happens in my life. And, 
you know, I always kind of, you know, hold on to that, which is cool. And there's a row of paparazzis. I mean, I mean, thousands of photographers, and they're screaming at you. They all know your name. I don't know how they know your name, but they're like, look this way, look this way. And I mean, it was just like, it was so, it was the coolest thing because I remember at one point I looked over and my entire family was standing there. <laughs> it was just cool. I remember the premiere of the movie was just like any other movie. It was huge. Uh, red carpet. I have to say that I probably have never seen so many kids uh, of actors at that premiere. Tom Hanks kids, uh, Demi Moore, all the famous kids were in that movie theater. There were like all kinds of, you know, famous stars, you know, like at the time Jean-Claude Van Damme brought his kids to see us, you know, and I remember in the movie I did the splits because I was kind of like an homage to him. So I went up and said, hey, that was that was for you, you know, I'm glad you're here, you know, it was cool. It's cool to meet Van Damme. Uh, Harold Ramis, you know, was there, he brought his kids. I think the weirdest thing for me, the movie premiere, I was walking outside the movie premiere, some kid in the bush, hey, White Ranger uh, pajamas on, can I have an autograph? And I was thinking, yeah, and this guy comes out. I know, I knew him from somewhere. Uh, he, he signed that for my kid, kind of mafia, you know? I was like, oh, I'll sign it for your kid. And I was thinking, who is that guy? And it was Michael Madsen. God, I remember him from like Reservoir Dogs and all. You know, he just looked like, sign that for my kid or I'm gonna chop you up, you know? But uh, being there, seeing so many, so many actors' kids was great. I remember just going across and seeing the fans there behind the gate. And, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, and I just go over there, I start signing, shaking hands. Next thing I know, some mom pulls me in to the crowd. And then I'm like, oh, now I'm panicked. And I'm like, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know? And then I can't remember who it was, but I think it was security or someone just kind of reached in and pulled me out. And I was like, ah, disheveled, like, what happened? Um, but yeah, so the moms were cra some of the moms were crazier than the kids. But uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty cool. It was, it was neat to see. Being in a movie premiere and seeing your face on a big screen is a lot different than seeing your face on a little screen. I mean, your head is blowing up so big. It's like, whoa, whoa. And you go, oh my, why did, I, why did I want this? It's terrible. The feeling was like, you know, when you record your voicemail message for the first time and then you hear it back and you're like, oh, why did I sound like that? Uh, so for me, it was like that, the, that feeling of like, oh man, why, why did I do that? And then some of the stuff was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then really kind of hearing the fans reacting to it you know or laughing at the i'm the frog i'm a frog thing and it was like oh that's cool all right um it's cool it was really cool i was very pleased with it I mean, in a way i hadn't expected to be i thought it was it was just a, a kid's film that wasn't going to amount to much how wrong was i look here we are 30 years later still talking about it and people still copying it but I remember going to that movie premiere thinking, you know, here we are from a TV show and then going to the movie premiere. Everything was big and, uh, you know, the red carpet. And I remember being there before, putting our hands in cement. Oh, yeah, because we did our hands and feet in the, in the cement. Um, yeah, we did the whole uh, little ceremony at the and uh, that was amazing. The fact that we got to go and we actually got to put our hands and our feet in cement at uh, Grauman's Chinese Theater um, is an experience that a lot of actors don't get. So the fact that we got to do that was uh, pretty fantastic. The cool thing they did with that was they actually took, instead of our hands and feet actually being there in the, in the, uh, the Grumman's Theater, they actually took those cement blocks and, and, and donated them to some children's hospitals around the country. So uh, our hands and feet are around some children's hospitals and all around the country, which was kind of cool. I like that they did that. When I look back at the pictures of that day, I just see the huge smiles on all of our faces and uh, it really was a, a powerful experience for me as an actor and um, it's a day that I'll never forget on many levels. Um, so I'm very grateful for it. Uh.